Sam. I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager here at Fairy God Boss. And Fairy God Boss is the largest career community for women. Our mission is to improve the workplace by increasing transparency. We offer a ton of great free resources like anonymous company reviews, job listings, virtual recruiting events, and so much more to help you succeed throughout your career. We will be saving some time at the end for your questions. So if you have any throughout the presentation, feel free to drop them in the Q&A. You'll find the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, right where you found the chat. And you can leave questions as yourself or anonymously. So don't be afraid to ask whatever comes to mind. We're also recording today's session and we will send it out in a follow-up email later today, along with some contact information for Alexis. So if you miss anything, you wanna rewatch it back or get in touch, you will have the chance to do so. Here with me today is Alexis Gladstone, founder of Interlead. Alexis is an international speaker, executive coach, and consultant, and she designs and delivers strategies and programs to help clients develop current and next generation leaders, increase the effectiveness of individuals in sales, and drive organizational change that delivers results. She has worked with organizations across a variety of industries, and she's coached and trained thousands of individuals and teams. She has the passion for empowering professional women and is a sought out voice on the topic of women in leadership, as well as a frequent podcast ghost, a guest around the globe discussing all things leadership. She's definitely not a ghost, but thank you so much for being here today, Alexis. I'll pass it over to you. Thanks for having me, Sam. I really appreciate it. I'm so excited to be here with all of you today. And yes, I am not a ghost. I actually am real. So um, I hope that everybody has a piece of paper, some paper and something to take notes with, because I'm hoping that I give you things that you can really take actionable items away. And also I've got a little few activities thrown in along the way. So if you want to participate in those, you're going to want to uh, have something to write with. So let's go ahead and I'm going to dive right in with actually the first activity. So on your piece of paper, here's what I'd like you to do. Now think the old Twitter, for those of you who use Twitter, the old Twitter was 140 characters. I would love to, for you to write, what is your number one leadership quality? Now, some of you might be saying, oh, Alexis, I'm not a leader because I don't have a team. And I would disagree with you and say that we're all leaders, even if we're leaders of ourselves. So 140 characters or less, write down what you think your number one leadership quality is. I'm gonna give you just a second and we are gonna revisit this toward the end. So you can just kind of write it down and put it aside. So Sam was gracious enough to uh, do my introduction. I think she covered pretty much everything that's in here. But if you just think of me as your support system, that's how I like to think of myself when I'm doing something like this and speaking to a group of fabulous women. And I, as she said, you know, I've worked in across all different types of industries. A lot of the industries, I'm sure something that you all can relate with have been very male dominated. So that's where my passion for empowering women and empowering professional women has come from because I love to help women not have to kind of do some of the things and do, that I had to do and have a support system along the way. So that's kind of the only thing I will add from, um, what Sam already said. So let's get in and talk about, you know, what we're here to talk about today. And I want to start by kind of looking at things and framing things as a challenge, because there, we do have a challenge. It's, it's something that's out there that we're looking for. We are looking for that next job. We're looking for that promotion. We're looking for maybe to work on that special project, maybe to win some, diff some specific business for our business. And sometimes is we don't always know how sh we should talk about ourselves, what we should be saying about ourselves, how should we sell ourselves? Do we talk about our years of experience? Or do we talk about something along the special projects that we've been on? Or do we talk about the awards we've won? Well. There's something that we need to talk about that we don't always think about. So I want to talk about it in terms of giving you a scenario to think about, which is, so think about this scenario. You have two individuals and they're interviewing for a job. On paper, they are pretty much neck and neck. They came from similar 
backgrounds in terms of the schools they went to, the type of GPA they had, the work experience they had. They show up at the interview. They're very, both very, very well prepared. They both are dressed for success as much as you can dress for success in the virtual world these days. And they're ready to go. And so they go into the interview. And the interviewer, the hiring manager, after she talks to both of these individuals, it's completely not even a question of who she's going to hire. What do you think the difference is? Let's see it in the chat. Confidence I see going on. Yep, it could be confidence, biases, simply soft skills. I didn't see who said that, but whoever said that, and I don't know it was the first person, it is. The winner demonstrated, the person who got the job demonstrated soft skills. And the other person, they didn't even know what soft skills are. So many times we go into these situations and we think we go into these interviews and we think, wow, it's you know the technical skills, it's what I bring, it's what I've done. And that's really, really important. But what's also really important is how we talk about how we interact with people, how we work with teams, how we communicate, how we show empathy. That is so much more important these days. And we're going to talk about where it's coming from and what people are saying in terms of hiring managers and recruiters looking at these things. So I want to do another experiment. So another piece of paper. And here's what you need to do with this piece of paper. I need you to create three columns. The first column, I want you to label IQ or smart, if you like that word. The middle column, I want you to label technical. And the last column, I want you to label others. So IQ, technical, other. Now, I want you to think about a mentor or a role model that you have. Maybe it's somebody you worked for, maybe it's somebody you worked with, but somebody who was a real mentor or role model for you. And I want you to think about the characteristics of this individual. And as you think about the characteristics, I want you to put them in the appropriate column. Are you thinking about something having to do with their smarts, having to do with their technical skills or other? So I'm going to give you just a minute to do that. And I want you to see where those different characteristics are landing. Okay, so where are most of your characteristics landing? Let's see in the chat. What do you have? Which column? The first, the second, or the third? The other, other. Yep, everything lands is landing in the other. That other care, that other column, what those things really are, those are whether you want to call them soft skills or essential skills, there's debate out there of what we call them these days. Those are what's falling in there. It's those other things that are sometimes really hard to quantify and to qualify. And some people think you can't learn them. You can, absolutely. But that other category is, that other column is soft skills and also emotional intelligence, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So in order to really make sure we're really clear on the differences between hard skills or technical skills in these other skills. I like to think of work in terms of two different buckets. There's what you do. So what you do is really what you're bringing to the table. It's the, the programming you do if you're a computer programmer. It's the sales that you do. It's all of those things. It's those job specific things. And then there's how you do it. So it's those things like how you get along with people, how you build, how you work in a team, how you communicate. It's a balance of having both of these. We don't always think about it, especially when we're thinking about going for a different job or getting um, going up the ladder in our particular job. We don't always think about that we need to be really be talking about and showing both of these skills. What I also like to say about the soft skills or essential skills is if we get really good at identifying what we excel at, then those turn into our, unique, our uniqueness about us. 
you know, we are all unique, but sometimes we can't really talk about what makes us unique. Being able to talk about and show these soft skills and show the soft, these, that side of us when we're at work and when we're talking about us ourselves, that's what makes us unique. Like Lauren, I'm glad you liked the, uh, liked the exercise. I just kind of looked down at the, at the chat a little bit. And if you don't believe me, just so you know, here's, what some, here's what's being said out there. There's a lot of statistics out there. 77% of employers, they believe that soft skills, these essential skills are just important as your technical skills or your hard skills. If you look at recruiters, you can see these statistics that are out here for recruiters. 94% of recruiting professionals think to get promoted into leadership roles, it's really gonna be those people that have the soft skills and can demonstrate those and bring that empathy to work. And again, and then 58% of recruiters think soft skills, especially as we go into leadership. And I believe they're important for everybody, but the higher up in leadership you go, the more they're looked at, because guess what? As you gain and go up the ladder in leadership, you have other people you can rely on for those technical skills. It's those soft skills are what's going to make you stand out as a leader. Now, I mentioned emotional intelligence a few minutes ago, and I just wanna make sure that we all kind of know generally what it is. I'm not getting into a whole thing on emotional intelligence here today. You can do a lot of reading out on the internet, but basically for those who don't know, emotional intelligence really has to do with being able to recognize and manage our own emotions and things that trigger us in those things. And then also being able to recognize and understand it for as, as you interact with other people. So there's kind of four buckets, so to speak. There's two buckets for each of those. Understanding our own emotions, it's called self-awareness. You know, so that takes a lot of introspection. That takes a lot of really understanding of ourselves. And then self-management. Once we know this all about us, once we know what emotions, you know, how our emotions are and how we're triggered, then how do we manage that so we can be our best at work and we can get our work done and we can interact well with people? The emotions of others really has to do with how do we, under, how do we recognize? So it's the awareness of, they call it social awareness is one of the terms. Do we recognize the emotions of others and that we're working with and that we, we work with people and we all have emotions. We all bring that to the table. And do we recognize it? And what do we do about it? So those are kind of what emotional intelligence is all about. And within emotional intelligence is some of these soft skills and some of these different things that are so important that leaders are really looking for these days. I saw uh, so many managers with a complete lack of soft skill. Laura, I, I think that's true. I, you know, that's really what goes on because sometimes the people that are promoted are not the best ones in terms of they're, they promote the best technical person. And that's not always the person that's had time to develop or to show their soft skills. So that's a really good point. So let's summarize where the things I've been talking about here before we get into the next piece of it. You know, it's really a balancing act of these hard skills and these soft skills. And they're both important. If you think about it, it's those technical, those hard skills. Those are the things that get you in the door. Those are the things we all need in order to do the basics of our job, whatever our job is. But if we wanna be set apart, and if we wanna move up and get ahead, then being able to balance those and being able to use our soft skills and being able to bring those to the table are what's really going to do that. And as we saw in some of those statistics, I'm not the only one saying it, it's out there and the more you read about it, it's even becoming more so that people are looking at these other sides of what we bring to the table. So that's kind of laying the groundwork in terms of where I wanted to talk about the difference between the hard and the soft skills. Now I wanna get into the second piece or the meat of it, which is really what I talk about is essential qualities. And there's seven of them. And here's how I think about them. So these are qualities that embody soft skills. And some of them, when I show them to you, some of them you're gonna look at them and say, yeah, that makes total sense. And some of them you're gonna look at and say, hmm, really? 
what is what are how is that a quality well these are qualities i'm going to be frank with you that as women we actually embody a lot of these and we actually have the opportunity to bring them to the table so as you look at what i'm and listen to what i'm talking about i would love for you to think about which ones you know do you think you can really capitalize on it as, as i said before if we can show our soft skills, if we can show that side of us, that's one of the ways we can stand out and differentiate ourselves. So which one of these, as I go through them, can you really work on and say, hmm, I can really bring that to the table and I can really start to stand out in a different way than I already do, because I know the women on here are absolutely fantastic based on the ones that I've interacted with over the, um, the chat and stuff and all over the over the time that I've been part of Fairy God Boss. So let's get into them. Here is the first one. It's all, it's called passion. You know, we all are passionate about things we love to do. We're passionate about things we're good at doing. And a lot of times we're passionate about things that come naturally to us. Now, some of us are really lucky and whatever we're doing for our career, whatever we're doing in our job, it actually embodies a lot of the passion that we already have. And some of us, you know, we don't necessarily have that opportunity. There might be pieces of it that we're passionate about, but not everything. You know, people who have passion and passion for what they do, even if it's parts of what they do, those are the types of people that always want to learn, always want to grow, and always want to get better. They find those pieces in themselves of what they can bring to the table, and they want to look at how they can capitalize it and build that strength even more. Now, if you're one of those people that don't ha happen to be in a job right now where you're bringing, able to bring a lot of the passion of what you have to work, there's other ways to bring it into your life, though. Sometimes it's a side gig. Sometimes it's doing something completely outside of work. I know that that's what I've had to do. So as I said before, you know, I'm passionate about empowering professional women. I'm passionate about doing things like this, speaking to groups of women, mentoring and coaching. I also have a passion. I'm passionate about fashion. I had a mother who was a kind of a fashionista and I got my, my love of fashion for her from her and I love it. And so I haven't figured out how to really in, embody it in what I do on a daily basis, but here's what I have been able to do from a side gig. I, want, I had a friend who at one point, she doesn't have it anymore. She had a website that she blogged about women, beauty, and fashion. And all her blog posts were always about women and beauty. And she didn't really have much around, around fashion. So I blogged the fashion for her. And that was just a lot of fun. It allowed me to bring out that creative and fun side of myself. So it was part of my side gig that I couldn't do on a daily basis. And she doesn't have that anymore. So what I do now is I actually, I live in Chicago and I'm friends with a lot of local designers. And I sometimes they'll come to me and ask for help in kind of their businesses. And so I get to get, learn a little bit more about their business and provide them some advice and counsel. So that's another way that I have found that I'm able to incorporate another passion of mine into you know, what I do on a regular basis. So what that does is it keeps me engaged and in, in, it keeps me engaged not only with them, but it keeps me engaged in things like this too. So if you can't find your passion and bring it completely into what you're doing at work 100%, maybe there's a side way you can bring it in. Now, some women, some people say it's like, well, I know I have this passion. I don't know, maybe there's a way to bring it into what I do at work, but I'm not really sure. Sometimes a personal mission statement can help. You know, in whatever you want to do in terms of how, what you think about a mission statement, you know, this is one that I actually took off the internet, but I actually completely relate to. I love inspiring people. And I do want people to say, because of you, I moved forward. I did something different. I didn't give it up, give up whatever it is. But if the idea of a personal mission statement it inspires you, here are some questions you can think about to start building yours. And I need to move the chat a little bit. So what do you want to do? Or what do you love doing? You know, if you think about what you love doing, just like I said, I love the thing around fashion. Who do you want to help? Or what kind of value do you want to create? If you start thinking about those questions, then you might be able to build a personal mission statement and figure out ways to incorporate bits of it inside of work. So let's talk about the next one which is authenticity. 
I define authenticity as being the same person you are when you're on the stage, off the stage, or when you're in the meeting or outside of the meeting. It's bringing your true self. It's showing up as your true self. Now, I don't know about you, but I have run into a lot of people who claim to be authentic and feel they have to announce the fact that they're authentic. And then they spend their time trying to prove it. And well, I don't know if they're proving it to me or if they're proving it to themselves. I don't believe if you're really your authentic self, I don't believe you have to announce it because it's going to shine through. It's going to be consistently doing things that are in aligned with your values. So you need to really know what those values are, and then you can align and show up. I know it's not always easy. I know that we're sometimes in situations at work where we don't feel we can be our authentic self, but I guarantee when you are, you're going to be much more valuable to the organization because you will be living and talking and working in a way that's your true authentic self. This also ties into emotional intelligence, which we were talking about before, because if we are self-aware it means we're very introspective and we've done a lot of work to really understand ourselves and understand what our strengths are and what our limitations are and bring that all to bear. So authenticity is, is what that's all about. Now, I also know there's common blocks to authenticity that, you know, that get in the way of us being our authentic selves. Two of them that I know that I have personally run into and I don't know about the rest of you, but one of them is being afraid of what people are going to think. And the other one is trying to live up to expectations we think people have about us that don't necessarily align with our authentic selves. Now, I know the afraid of what people think. I ran into that. It was actually six years ago, six years ago next month. Six years ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And in March, six, it'll be six years, I had a double mastectomy. Now I'm a really private person. I didn't even tell a lot of my friends about my diagnosis at first. I just um, was private about it. Slowly people started to get to, to know about it. I think my family told more of their friends than I told my friends to begin with. But over time, what I realized after a few years had passed is this was part of me. And it had changed me in a particular, in a specific way. And if I wasn't my authentic self and if I didn't share what I had learned, then I wasn't really being true to myself. So what I did, I actually wrote a blog post that's on my website and it was um, breast cancer and leadership lessons. And I posted it and every October I share it back on, out on LinkedIn because it's, because October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And one year, and I don't remember if it was the first year or the second or the third, a woman reached out to me on LinkedIn and she said, thank you so much for posting that. I'm going through this right now and reading this reminded me of how much strength and fortitude I have. Now, if I had been my authentic self and shared that, I wouldn't have been able to help her. And by being able to help her, that was kind of what authenticity does for you. And I also don't know who else I may have helped who didn't reach out to me and tell me. So authenticity, it's really, if you feel you can be your authentic self, you don't know what difference you're going to make. Courage. How many of you think of courage in terms of a leadership or a characteristic that's important for us in business? You know, I know earlier we said, um, when I said, you know, what the person, uh, the interviewer, the person interviewing got, who got the job, and a couple of people said confidence. And a lot of people interchange confidence and, and courage, and they're actually quite different. Confidence is believing you can do something and believing in yourself. Courage is actually going and doing it despite the fear that you might have. So it's really a cycle because if we don't show courage and if we don't try something despite how we feel, how fearful we are, we're never going to do it and we're never going to build the confidence. So they're completely interrelated and they're really an important part of being our, of 
being, you know, who we are and being our best at work. Now, I started thinking about this a lot more when I had a coaching client several years ago who was trying, she'd hired me because she wanted to get into this um, larger job and was trying to kind of work through and figure it out whether it was the right move for her. And she said to me, how do I get the courage to do it? And I really had to stop and think about this dichotomy between courage and um, confidence, because I wasn't sure if she was if she was afraid, or if she just really didn't have confidence in herself that she was able to do it. And then it got me thinking about myself, and some of the different things that I've done along the way. Because you know, if we're courageous, we're going to face what we have in front of us no matter what, and we're going to take those steps and we're going to do it. Now, sometimes what we do is we just start working toward it. And if we work in it and we get totally engaged in whatever we're doing, we don't have time to think about, am I still fearful about doing it? And then all of a sudden we turn around and we look and we're like, oh my gosh, I did it. So sometimes it's just taking that first step. And we don't always recognize courage within ourselves. A lot of times others recognize the courage that we have within us. For instance, when I left corporate world and went out into consulting, I didn't really think of it as courageous. I thought of it as a decision I made. I have a side story that I'm not going to go into about how I got into consulting, but courage was never the way I looked at it. Yet I've had a number of different friends over the years say to me, you know, it was so courageous of what you did. It was so courageous to leave corporate America and go out on your own and make it happen. And I never thought of it that way. So sometimes we don't even see the courage in ourselves and we need people to remind us that we have it. Now you may be wondering, well, what might courage look like at work? Here are some things that maybe, you know, some of these might resonate with you, none of them might resonate with you, but these are kind of some of the ones that I've thought about and I've talked with people about over the years. Sometimes depending on our situation, we want, Speaking candidly can be courageous, depending on what our situation is and where we're working. Speaking candidly, though, can do so much both for yourself, for your credibility, for your authenticity. And a lot of times what we're holding back is really something that can help the organization or the group move forward. So that can be courageous. Going for that promotion or that job, that can be courageous, depending on where we're coming from. You know, that takes courage to go do it and face the fear of fear of rejection. So that takes courage. Advocating for ourselves. You know, we're all learning about how we can stand out in our uniqueness. Now you want to be able to advocate for yourself. And it's not always easy to talk about ourselves, but doing that can take courage. Raising your hand for a special project, something you might want to work on that, you know, you don't know if you have the skills to do it. You know, here's what I say when it comes to courage and whether it's a promotion or a job that you're looking at um, applying for or that special project, we need to show the courage that we know men do. If you've seen the statistics, you know that the stats out there say that as women, most of us wait until we can check off all 10 things on the list before we say we're going to go for that job. I don't know how many of you have done that and been in that situation. And they say, well, men, they're going to go for the job or the promotion if they can check off four out of the 10. So what about if we show some courage and we do it if we don't, if we can't check off all the 10? So those are some ways that courage can show up at work. Let's talk about the next one, communication. Now we know that this is a huge topic and we know how important communication is in all walks of life both our personal life and at work. And we know that communication or the lack of it also can lead to some of the biggest problems out there. Because when organizations aren't good at communication, it leaves a lot of room for interpretation of what people think is really going on or what's not going on. So it's really an important skill for us to really get a handle on. And besides the fact that in work, if the at work, it helps us get along with people, it helps us build relationships. With organizations, it helps increase morale and productivity and commitment. So there's so many good reasons that we really need to get good at communication. 
Now, when I think about communication and we talk about it, it's really the umbrella of communication involves so much thing, so many things. It involves the words, whether it's speaking or the written words. It involves questions. It involves body language. It involves building relationships. That's really what we're doing in a lot of times when we're communicating. And there's, oops, and we're going backwards. And there's a lot of things that we can talk about with communication, but here's one that's not talked about a lot and what I want to talk about, which is listening. You know, there's, again, we could talk about communication. We could have a two-day workshop on it. But listening is something that usually gets about this, a tiny, tiny bit of the action when you, even in any um, communication training you might go through. If you think of communication as, words, body language, and tone of voice, because we're talking about the spoken word right now, there's actually a breakdown of how those come of the components of that. The words that you use is really only 7% of the message. The tone of voice is 38% of the message. And the body language is over 50% of the message. So think about the world we're living in right now. We're in a virtual world where we can, if we're in a virtual um, meeting and people are at least showing their cameras, we can see some body language, not all. We can definitely hear the words and we can definitely hear the tone. But body language, and that, that part's a little harder depending on where the cam how the camera is. Or we're also in an age where we use text and email and Slack and other things that I think there's some Slack equivalents that I'm not familiar with. Those, all you get are the words. And I don't know how many of you have ever been caught in one of those email loops where something is said in an email and somebody reads a tone into it that just isn't there or was not meant. And then this whole vicious cycle of emailing back and forth happens. So listening is just not just listening when we're in person or something like this. Listening is also listening for what's not being said and really trying to read tone into things. Being a good listener is really something that can really make you stand out. Now, I have a little, for those of you, if you're interested in, you can take a screen, I'll leave this up for a second so you can take a screenshot. This is a little assessment. Now, when Sam sends out the follow-up, there'll actually be a link that you can actually download the this assessment with more detail and use. But let me just quickly tell you how you can use this listening assessment. There's 12 questions and you can see it's on a continuum. And what you do is somewhere on the continuum, you put your X of where you think you fall on that continuum. And then you can draw a vertical line kind of connecting all your X's. If you're falling more to the left, you're probably practicing a lot of good listening skills. If you're following more, more to the right, there might be things you wanna think about working on. If there are things you wanna work on, I say pick one or two and, and work on them. You don't wanna work on everything at once, but this is just kind of a way, it's just a quick way to just kind of test and see where you think you fall in listening. Because again, those people who listen really well are really people, you're, they're really going to help you build relationships and it's really gonna help you stand out. Something else I wanna talk about before we finish up with listening that's not talked about quite as much as some of these other things, which is asking good questions. And asking good questions can do a lot of different things when it comes to your communication. First of all, it engages people into the conversation. It's also really good because you can learn a lot about what's going on. You can learn a lot about an individual or a group when you're asking good questions. And this is the best way to build relationships. This is what we I talk in the sales training stuff I do. We talk a lot about asking good questions. Now, the questions I talk about are open-ended questions, which you can see here are your who, what, when, where, why, how. These are questions that elicit more than a yes, no response. They elicit things and they get people talking and Let's face it, most people love talking about themselves. So if you become ask, good at asking questions, the other thing you have to do is really listen, which is why listening is so important because it allows you to continue to engage and build those relationships with individuals and with teams. So that's 
communication. Now, let's look at decision making or decisiveness. Did you know that when you get up in the morning, there are probably somewhere between eight and 12 decisions that you make first thing in the morning. The first one is probably, do I hit the snooze, assuming that I slept until my alarm went off? And then it goes from there. And then depending on what you do for work, depending on your, how your day is laid out, you can make upwards of maybe 70 different decisions throughout the day. It, de it, it all depends on what's going on that particular day and what, and what you're doing. Now, some of them are big decisions. Some of them are small decisions, like hitting the snooze. But the idea is we really want to have different ways to think about how we can get better at making decisions, those big ones and those small ones. There's a saying, and the saying is that if you have to eat a frog, eat it first thing in the morning. So when you're trying to decide how to start your day, and that is a decision we have to make. You know, sometimes it's we get to work or we get to our desk and what am I going to attack first? What's the task I'm going to do first? If you decide that you're going to attack the hardest one, that's a good decision to make because once you get that one done, all those other decisions that you have to make throughout the day are gonna be so much easier. And there's also a corollary to that, that if you have two big decisions to make, if you have two frogs to eat, eat the biggest one first. So those are the type of thing to think about as you're trying to make decisions of how to organize your day and what to attack. And those are really important decisions to make. There's other decisions that we have to make. Some of them might be more personal. And here's a little tool that I want to share with you that I have found. If this was, it was a, it's been adapted from, for those of you who might be on here that are old enough to remember the old total quality management. It's been adapted from those tools. I think it was Toyota that created this and it's called the five whys. And I use this to really evaluate decisions, some hard decisions I have to make. And the idea is, let me explain what it is. You ask why you're making this decision or why you want to do something or not do something. And then you ask why four more times. So you're asking why five times. Let me kind of explain what it might look like. Let's say, you're deciding that whether to interview for a new job because the new, the, or interview for a promotion because the promotion means you're now going to be a leader. You're now going to have a team of people. So the first why might be, why do you want the position? And your response to yourself might be, well, I really want to have a larger impact in my organization. Well, why, why else do you want this position? Well, it might be that I want to help people learn and grow because I've had really good managers who have helped me learn and grow. Well, why do you want to help people learn and grow? Well, I think that I have a lot of things that I bring to the table, especially as a woman in business, and I want to be able to impart that knowledge on people. Why is that important to impart that knowledge on people, you ask yourself? Well, my goal is to always make a bigger impact. And then the fifth why would be, why do you want to make that bigger impact? And maybe the answer might be, well, because that's part of my core values. So as you use this tool to kind of evaluate and dig deeper into this big decision you have to make, you can really get down to the root of what might be driving you to either do it or not do it. So that's a really good tool that I hope you find useful. Let's talk resilience. You know, what is resilience? Resilience is the ability to adapt to change, to recover from a setback, or to keep going when we have some type of adversity. And we all know setbacks are just going to happen. It's a normal part of life. We have setbacks at personal setbacks, and we have setbacks at work. And how we ad adapt to them, how we respond to them, is what makes us resilient. I know there's sometimes all we want to do is go grab our blanket, go crawl into bed and just kind of lie there for a little bit. And we might actually do that for about five minutes. But those of us then were like, OK, now we have to do something about it. So now you have to start thinking about what are you going to do and how are you going to respond to it? People who are resilient, they look at setbacks differently. They look at them as opportunities. They look at them as ways to learn and grow. And they look at them as something that they can go through and get through and come out better and different on the other side. So they focus on the positive of what might be there, which we know isn't always 
an easy thing to do, but the more you practice it, the more you will get better at doing it that way. Resiliency, some people look at resiliency as, you know, reason to have plan A, plan B, and plan C. Or if you're like other people, there's 26 letters in the alphabet, you can have plans A through Z. I don't kind of abide by that. My thinking is setbacks are going to happen. How am I going to respond? And yes, there are times that I want to take my own blanket and I want to crawl into bed. But here are some ideas to help you, ways to be resilient, that if you start practicing them over time, you'll build the muscle. And it really is a muscle that we're talking about when it comes to resiliency. First of all, mindfulness can really help. And whatever mindfulness is to you, whether it's meditating, whether it's just sitting quiet time, but being able to practice removing yourself and stepping back and taking those deep breaths is one way to recenter yourself and reset yourself before you have to go make your decision of how you're going to move forward through this. The other thing you do can do that can help just you be resilient just overall and in general is taking breaks throughout the day. We are so driven. We are so in the mode of, um, of being, you know, go, 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 that we don't always step back and take a break. So if you can build these breaks into your day, when you do come up against one of these setbacks, it can really help move you forward. We also have to be more compassionate with ourselves. You know, we're our hardest, we're our worst critics, and we're our hardest critics. If you can cultivate self-compassion, so, and be able to, um, to forgive yourself and be able to just say that everything's okay, that's going to help build your resiliency. And my favorite, and I actually have this right now, develop a personal sounding board. You know, I have a group of women that we kind of got started getting together at the beginning of the pandemic virtually, and we just did it more socially, but we now call ourselves the Women's Council because we do during the middle of the day, if somebody has a setback, they might shoot a text, they want some advice, they want, you know, they want to um, get a different perspective, or we just want to vent and sometimes it all, that's all we need to do. So these are some ways that you can build resiliency. And finally, I want to talk about generosity. I don't know what images come to mind when you hear the word generosity. Maybe it's children sharing their toys. Maybe it's giving money. Maybe it's groups coming together to help with something in, going on in the community. Whatever your take of generosity is, there's a lot of ways that you can embody generosity and show it. My favorite when I talk about generosity, and I'll talk about more in a few minutes, has to do with giving time, because time is something that you really can't get back. And generosity, believe it or not, is actually good for us. It's good for our brain. There's actually been a study that's been done that shows that if we're generous, they looked at generosity in two different ways. They called it targeted and untargeted. Targeted generosity was we did something and we knew who the recipient of this generosity is. And untargeted is we did something, maybe gave some money or donated something, but we didn't know who received it. Both of them made our brains feel better. They made us feel altruistic. Targeted generosity really makes, uh, made, um, it helped with the, it, it impact, sorry, it impacted the amygdala, which in the amygdala regulates our stress. And stress went down if we did some generous act and we actually knew who the recipient was. This happened to me right before the pandemic. I was having a really, really bad week. I went, to, took myself to my favorite breakfast place. It was a Saturday or Sunday. It was super crowded. There's a little bar with three seats. I sat at the bar, started chatting with the woman next to me. She told me it was her birthday. And for so, don't, as we were chatting and we were having great conversation, I decided to treat her to her breakfast. And she was forever grateful because she you know, told me how she was going to spend the rest of her birthday. And I have to tell you, I could feel myself shift, the stress that I was feeling completely started to abate. So it really does affect how we feel. Now there's a lot of different ways at work. We can be generous. We can be generous with our knowledge. We can be generous through our knowledge at work. We can be generous through the forum of Fairy God Boss. There are so many of you I see out there on the forum all the time, answering questions, asking questions. We can share resources, whether it's resources we have or introductions we have. We can share opportunities. And as we said, I said, we can share our time. And this is how I like to share my time. I don't know about you, how many of you have had mentors? 
or how many of you are mentors. Mentoring is my favorite way to give back because I don't, if you're familiar and if you are lucky enough to have had a mentor, you know that a mentor is somebody who is in your corner. They are there for you. They're your sounding board. They're going to share their lessons of, that they've had along the way in their careers, and they're going to hopefully challenge you, make you think differently. And being a mentor can be some of the most rewarding things that we can do as women. And did you know? I don't know if you know this, but 65% of women who actually have a mentor will turn around and be a mentor for someone else. And I don't know about you ladies, but I think we need more mentors in the world because they are a great way for us to grow in our careers and grow in our, or grow our business if we're our own business person and in ways that we can't do it alone. So if you think you have the time, and I say if you think because it does take time, and I know we're all busy, I strongly encourage you to consider being a mentor. I guarantee that you are going to get as much out of it as the person that you're mentoring. And I know that the men and the women that I've mentored along the years, I have learned so much from them and have grown by having that relationship. And if you haven't had a mentor, and you want a mentor, because I do get this question, what if I want a mentor? You know, what if I've met somebody and I want him or her to be my mentor? My recommendation is ask. If the person has the time and the fortitude and it's something that they like doing, and if you tell them why it's important to you, I guarantee that if it's something that's in their makeup and they wanna do, they're gonna say yes, and they're going to be completely honored that you ask them. So don't be afraid to ask somebody to be your mentor. So kind of summarize where we are because I want to leave time for questions. Don't, you know, Fairy God Boss is such a great forum and we're on it because we all want to share our knowledge and we all want to share our greatness. So don't hoard your knowledge. Make sure you're out there sharing your soft skills, your greatness, these qualities, because if you do it, Together, we can do so much more than any of us can do alone. And this community that Fairy God Boss has built is just that much better by interacting with each other and by helping each other. So my question for you before we open it up for questions is, did anything change? Those 140, what, that little thing you wrote at the beginning, based on what I've shared with you, did anything change for you in terms of what's your now number one leadership quality? I would love to know. And with that, oh, you know, just I'm going to put, leave this up here. So if people want to know how to get a hold of me, and I guess, Sam, we can open it up for questions. Perfect. Thank you so much. As I mentioned before, you can leave your questions in the Q&A and I'm at the bottom of your screen. And you can leave questions as yourself or anonymously. So feel free to ask whatever comes to mind. But I already saw a ton come through, so let's get started. The first question comes from an anonymous attendee, and they said, I was in a more technical role at my last job, but so much of my success came from my soft skills. How do I communicate that in my resume in a way that can help me stand out to recruiters, especially when my most recent role was very specialized? I think if you can find ways to talk about um, any team activities you did and things, you know, if you had a leadership role in those types of things or a leadership role for a project, and when you talk about things like that, when you talk about, you know, coming in, you know, technical roles, a lot of times there's schedules and then there's time and budget and things like that. So sometimes it's not as easy to have the words on the, on the resume with them, but it certainly can in the cover letter talk about those types of things. So anything having to do with team activities, if there's anything you've done outside of your technical role, I mean, did you participate in other different types of groups that maybe weren't directly related to your, your role? You know, were you part of a, a, a um, you know, a mentoring program or, you know, helping new hires navigate, or did you write something for um, a magazine or some, you know, some kind of internal something 
internal magazine or internal blog, those types of things can show that you're more well-rounded than just those technical skills you're bringing to the table. Yeah, that's a great point. And I mean, it all comes back to what impact did it have on your team and your company? Mm -hmm. It's not always a numbers thing. I know with sales, it's very numbers driven, but with other jobs, maybe it didn't, you know, increase the bottom line or anything like that, but maybe you made the team more productive or you got new ideas because you led some new initiative or something like that. Um, it might take a little more creative thinking, um, but I think all of the advice Alexis gave is, is on point. It's perfect. And that's what you should try and implement in your resume. Um, looks like we had a lot of questions about implementing soft skills into the resume. That is definitely something that is top of mind. Um, Lauren wants to know, do you have any tips for continuing to practice our active listening in a low risk scenario? So I'm assuming that means anything outside of an actual interview. That's a great question, Lauren. And what I always recommend to people, practice outside of work. So practice when you're with your, you know, with your family or with your girl, you know, with your girlfriends, you know, a lot of times we're doing this, right? We're on our phones or we're on whatever our other multimedia is, put that aside and really practice outside of work and active listening. A lot of times, you know, I didn't get into some of the details, but it's kind of rephrasing, you know, making sure you're understanding people. So, you know, reframing or saying, you know, I think what I heard you say is, and we didn't talk about a lot of those skills. I didn't, because we did interest of time. But if you start practicing those outside of work, then you can start bringing them inside of work. Or if there's somebody you work closely with that you're close to at work, just practice with the two of you, you know, when you're in different, when you're working together in a project or a team. Great advice. Ooh, interesting question from an anonymous attendee. They said, uh -oh. do you have any recommendations for dealing with, oh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, an anonymous attendee asked, do you have any recommendations for dealing with leaders who are intimidated by your authenticity? Oh, that's, that's a huge, huge question. And, that, and that's really a hard one. And I think it happens a lot. I think one of the best things you can do is really try to get to know the leader a little more personally, if you can spend more one-on-one -on -one time with them so they get to know you and you get to know them. It helps you be able to read them better when you're in group situations by doing that. And, you know, if they get to know you on that one-on-one -on -one better, then they're not necessarily when you're in the group setting as intimidated because they know better where you're coming from. So that would be where I would start. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, another question from an anonymous attendee here, and I already read it, so I want to thank you for sharing this because this is a very personal question. They said, I find that it's hard to speak confidently because I'm obese. I always feel like I'm exposed and I hate to be the center of attention. Do you have any advice on how to feel confident or at least project confidence when you aren't? I'm very confident in my abilities, both soft and hard, but it's not always easy because I feel so exposed. Oh, wow. That is such a great question. I would actually love for this individual, if they're comfortable to reach out so we can maybe talk about it, you know, some different ways. But what comes to mind first is if there's something, the thing you feel most confident with, whether it's something in their soft skill or whatever that those, the job skill is, find a way to find that one thing to project and practice. If you do one thing at a time, you know, it's kind of like, if they say, well, how do you eat an elephant? You eat it one bite at a time. Find the one thing to work on first, where you feel confident. And you also, if, it's a, if you can find a place where you feel the most um, supportive. So if it's in a particular group or working with a particular group of people or in, in a particular type of meeting where you know you have the best support that can help you. Another thing that comes to mind is if we're talking about in a group setting and in a group meeting, do you have a friend at work or colleague that you trust that they can kind of be your cheerleader? They're your silent cheerleader. They can give you a signal. They can you know, kind of prop you up to show you that, yes, you're doing well and you're on the right track. Having that can sometimes be really helpful, having that other person in the room as a way to, so we're not there and ex feeling exposed by ourselves. Yeah, finding an ally, that's a really mm -hmm. great point. 
A lot of questions here about hard and soft skills. Anusha asked, how do we point them out during an interview versus resume? And I would add to that, is there a better place for each one? For example, is it better to talk about soft skills in an interview and hard skills on the resume? What's your what's your advice there? What's the balance? I'm, I'm going to I'm going to give you my my take on it without being an expert on writing resumes these days. It's been a long time since I've written resumes. I believe resumes are really to show results. You know, that's what you were saying before, Sam, you know, the numbers, the, you know, if you're in sales, it's always the sales numbers. If it's, you know, if you do project work, it's, you know, on time, on budget, how much money you saved, all of those different types of things. Those are what resumes are really supposed to shine with. If you can work some of those soft skills in because of a particular project or something, you know, of how you garnered a team or something like that, and you, you can do it in a short way, that's great. I think it's the interview. I think it's the one-on-one -on -one or the group on one. It's that's where you shine and that's where your soft skills come through. That's where you can give examples of how you brought this team together that maybe wasn't working well, how you um, communicated with something, how you did a particular presentation. And then just the way you present yourself is one way to shine and show your soft skills right then and there. Perfect. And then I think we have time for one more question. So this is a bit of an opinion question. I'll preface it with that. It's from Marissa. Okay. She said, soft skills are much more subjective than, <clears throat> excuse me, than hard skills, of course. She asked, do you think some recruiters use a lack of soft skills as a way to justify that they didn't like a candidate, but they can't exactly figure out why? Or they might justify unconscious biases against a candidate who's technically qualified. They'll use that excuse of they didn't have the right soft skills. Uh, you know, I, d I don't know. And I mean, I'm just going to be honest about that. I think, I mean, I think there's just like everything else, there's really good recruiters and there's really recruiters that might not so be so good. And, you know, I think when we're in, a, when we're in a job search, we run into both. I think those who are not, maybe not as good at what they do and can't articulate what it is of why somebody might not fit you know, a particular role. I don't know if they use the soft skills to justify it. I think a lot of times they use, I, what I hear more, especially my friends who are going through job search, it's more fit, you know, fit with the company, which isn't really necessarily a soft or hard skill thing. So yeah, that's a, that's a question that I don't think we would even have time to answer, even if I even had a good answer for you on it. Yeah. And I think it comes back to Alexis, what you were saying about being able to communicate your soft skills, you know, putting your hard skills on your resume, where you're showing what you've done mm -hmm. to being able to communicate how the soft skills that you have really help impact your team. And, you know, if you can effectively communicate that in your interview, you know, hopefully it wouldn't come to that situation where the recruiter thinks you might lack those skills anyway. Um, but that brings us to just about time. So I want to say thank you so much to Alexis for spending the last hour with us and answering all of our questions. Thank you to everybody who attended today and spent the last hour with us. We really appreciate your time. Alexis, do you have any closing thoughts before I end things? No, I just, you know, my closing thought would be, as I said before, you know, just remember that it's this mix now and what you bring to the table is so important and you are amazing and you can be unique and just go out there and shine. And please, anyone who wants to connect with me, you saw it on my, you saw the slide and I know Sam is going to be sending that out too. I love connecting with the women in this forum. Awesome. Thank you so much. You will get the recording as well as Alexis's content contact info to your inbox by the end of the day today. You can always access the recording on the Fairy God Boss events page. Thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your week and we'll catch you next time. Bye.